Thanks, that's great. Um, it's just Eamon and me talking today. Um, Mark's actually unusually back in the office, uh, and Mairead is at another session, I think. So we're going to talk about some work that we've been doing on evaluating different journal articles. Um, we're based in Dublin City University, and our motto is Transforming Lives and Societies. And we're both part of the National Institute for Digital Learning, and we're in the Opening Up Education Unit, which looks after our online students. Um, as I mentioned this morning, we're hosting the World Conference uh, on Online Learning, so we really recommend you come to that. Uh, submissions for concise papers, lightning talks, and digital posters are open till the 3rd of May, so do please think about putting an abstract in. So, questions we want to ask you is what do you read, where do you find your materials, and how often or frequently do you read? So these are the three questions that underpinned uh, our project. An interesting uh, survey from um, Perkins and Lof I can't pronounce his name, but whoever it is, Patrick. Um, okay. Um, estimated there were about 270 open access journals, which is really quite significant. And we have collated a list of open educational um, journals uh, on our website. So do have a look at that if you're interested in it. But the problem is we're drowning in openness. If you add to that open access set of journals, you've also got the blogosphere as well. And we need to develop some kind of reading strategy and support a more scholarly reading culture. So about three years ago, we started an initiative where we looked at different journal articles and then identified what we considered were the best top ten. So, um, we, 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 in, we started in 2016, and as Grani mentioned, it was really about um, capacity development, particularly for, for younger researchers and scholars, but also for, for all academics, because it's it's so such a busy world and we're trying to find time to slow down and print out an article and read it uh, so we crowdsourced a bunch of articles from a number of journals open access journals in the area of educational technology and we came up with um, 10 our top 10 mm -hmm. so we have a we had a methodology for how we did these evaluations and we'll talk a bit more about that so uh, we released them once a day on Twitter in December of 2016. So we got a bit of uh, hype going that way and got a bit of attention to it and said, we'll wait for our article next week and so on. Uh, then in 27, we did it again. Um, uh, we, it, again, in December, we had our top 10 reads from... Uh, a number of journals, so we added in some more. Um, uh, so we, we blogged about the articles as well, and we explained a bit about each of them. Uh, so we had uh, a number of selection criteria, uh, and the questions we were asking is, what do we, how do we evaluate these articles? They've already been peer reviewed and so on, so they meet, they're meeting certain criteria, but what is the value for us in, in reading them and for us as a, as a research team and, and for promoting uh, scholarly reading and, and scholarship more generally? Um, and who do we involve and how do we get people to, and what is the validity of, of our selection? Um, Uh, so, our selection criteria were that they needed to be published in a, an open access journal, and all of the journals are, are what, what could be called diamond open access, and that they, they don't charge APCs, so they're very accessible to, to publish in. Restricted to higher education, but inclusive teacher education. Uh, we were looking for journals that had some kind of an international outlook or focus. Uh, we, were, we had some preference to journals published by professional bodies, learned societies, to try and support them. 
we were, and again, this was not uh, necessarily fully uh, uncontroversial decision that we had a preference for literature reviews, uh, meta analyses, because they would give people a, a, an introduction to an area. Um, and also the ones that were addressing new and emerging areas or major gaps. Some other minor preferences, uh, journals challenging conventional thinking, articles current to our projects and, and things we had on. So there was, there was a kind of a, a random element to it that way as well. And then we were trying to get a mix of gender, cultural, geographic diversity. Um. I have to say this was a, a lot of work. Um, uh, we had a really large list of journal articles uh, to go through. And I was, uh, as many of you may know, I've only been at DCU since September. So it was my first time. Uh, so December was quite a, a manic uh, time trying to read all these articles. But um, Mark Brown is very active on Twitter. Um, and uh, releasing these on a daily basis you know, gave it some oomph and anticipation, and we've had lots of people uh, saying it was really valuable. So these are some of the articles from 2017. Blended learning, citation patterns, and publication networks. Uh, a couple here, thematic patterns in international blended learning. Reviewing content analysis of the International Review of Research in Open and Distance Learning, Distributed Learning. Trends and patterns in MOOCs. Theories and frameworks for online education. Critical review of the use of Wenger's community of practice. Um, again, that's an interesting one because the uh, COP uh, framework has been used extensively by people, so there's lots of interest in it. Refining success and dropouts in massive online courses based on the intention behavior gap. Uh, educational uh, resources. Uh, and again, here, Rory's a very well known name in the field. National Study of Online Learning Leaders in U.S. Higher Education. Um, bot Teachers, a uh, very topical uh, issue. Gamification, again, very topical. So we had uh, 22 authors in 2017, uh, a good geographical spread, about 60% men, 40% women. There were notable gaps in the reports we cited in research topics. Uh, Erodal was still a very important uh, leading uh, publication, and uh, the majority were aligned with, as uh, Eamon said, professional bodies. AJAT, again, another very important um, journal, uh, very high impact, uh, and linked with the very well-known Ascolite conference, which occurs in um, Australia and New Zealand. So I think I've, I've hogged the light a bit here, sorry. Eh? sorry. In 2018, um, we had um, a Google Drive folder where we put all the articles, and I think there were around about 100, I seem to remember. Mm -hmm. So a lot of articles to read, and there were four of us, just four of us, I think, reviewing them. Is that right? We had a wider group, but at one stage we had a big wide group, and then it was a sub-selection of four of us for a finish. Yeah. So that was Mark, Mairead, uh, Eamon, and myself. And then we... Um, chose them each individually and then um, gave reasons for our choices and then ultimately Mark was the one who made the final decision um, as which ones we would go ahead with. I'm going to hand over to you. Yeah, yeah. so I've given a shout out to AJET as well. I'm involved in, as an editor on an AJET and uh, uh, Trends and patterns in the open hemisphere. I always think as well with, with articles, a good title is, is key because it's, uh, and the open hemisphere, someone, Martin Dugiamis was giving out last night on uh, Twitter about the global south. He didn't like the term the global south, but <laughs> I think we can all probably agree the open hemisphere is a great title. Um, helping doctors, students, this is Melissa Bond, a really interesting one as well. Cracked publication code. Um, one from the International Journal of Education Technology and Higher Education, from Alt's own Research and Learning Technology, it's also big on our on our radar, and uh, some fellow called Martin Weller with his 20 years of ed tech, uh, we which only was put that in if we knew he'd be here. yeah exactly we we <laughs> we had to paste that in when we saw him coming in there so. Uh, which is a, a, a great read that I'm sure everyone's uh, familiar with, a great piece of scholarship because we, we have to remember where we came from. 
several others. And I guess the other thing is that um, to mention these are only a fraction of, of, of the actual extant literature because Pio et al. had a brilliant study out in F1000 research last year about uh, how much of the worldwide literature is open access or not, and very little of it is. Um, and that was one of the things in our selection. We were, we were saying, are we going to include green access and authors who publish in the repository in closed journals? And we kind of were still debating about whether we include those or not. Uh, so these are the top journals that we um, had, had, have been looking at and, and reading. We've mentioned most of them. Open on, 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 Journal of Online Learning is another one, Open Praxis. Uh, that we haven't mentioned yet, and uh, distance education is sneaking in there, but it's not an open access journal. Uh, and there's there's a, a somebody here, I presume here, the, the editors of the new special edition coming out in on open educational practices in that journal. So there's been some talk about about the accessibility of that. Uh, so three takeaways: we've an increased number of systematic reviews and meta-analyses, and that's not un uncontested insofar as it, we still, we still, primary research is very important, but we're trying to give people access to literature and say, look, here's a, here's a, a key document you can get into a field quickly by, it's a primer, if you like. Uh, the blurring of boundaries between open and closed publications, those differences between gold access and green access, and that can get very complex. People almost need a, a type of open access literature, uh, literacy to understand that. Uh, and a question of whether the best articles still remain in closed journals, so that the most prestigious and highly cited uh, journals, such as Computers and Education, for example, is um, not in our list. And we're just, uh, no, we're not out of time. We're close to time, so. Um. Okay. So, um, it, it, as I said before, it was really difficult to choose, and of course it's very biased, but it's a, a really interesting uh, exercise to take part on and certainly from a personal point of view it's great to be forced to read all those articles and find out what was going on. Uh, Eamon mentioned systematic reviews. I think one of the reasons we chose Martin's article was it was a, a key point in terms of giving a trajectory of where EdTech had gone to uh, over the last 20 years so it was very valuable from that point of view. So the question is, is too much reading uh, really a bad thing? I think the answer has got to be no. And do you have to pay to be a member of the gym for the best exercise? So that's the analogy in terms of the kind of open, closed um, uh, argument. And I think it's interesting that a number of people are increasingly choosing to only publish openly and refusing to publish uh, or uh, review for closed uh, journals. And I think that's a good thing. But we've still got the issue about playing the game in terms of um, the perception that um, articles in closed journals are better and count more for things like the research assessment exercise in the UK. So I think there's still a battle to be had um, in terms of what happens. And the final question is, does open scholarship need recentering? So that's what we'd uh, leave you with. And I think we've got a little bit of time for discussion. Love to hear from you about uh, what, what, how do you read literature? What, what's your strategy? Do you get things from colleagues? Do you find it on social networks, or would this participating this kind of exercise be of interest or useful? Um, Mairead joined us, so I'm going to put her on the spot. Is there anything you want to add, Mairead? Um, I think the next step for us is actually either demystifying that debate or um, saying, well, actually, it's true. So we can go through this exercise and we can select our top 10 journals. But then I think we need to do another step in the uh, another step and to take that step and go, OK, let's look at the most cited articles, whether they're in open or closed, and let's try and do a comparative analysis. So that for me is for us to for us to challenge that and potentially come back and say, well, OK, using whichever template that we choose to do that um, and basis for that analysis. But I think we need to do that because I think it's the next step of debunking or saying that the myths are true. I, th I think it's interesting in terms of citations, often the articles that get most cited are not actually good. 
<laughs> or being criticised. So I did an article a few years ago um, with a colleague, Martin, from Southampton, on um, affordances, and it was really heavily uh, criticised, and therefore it was heavily cited. So that was a good way of getting lots of fly journals. Francis? No, none of them did, and it's a really good question, uh, Francis, because I think that that's important. Like, uh, if it's like a, maybe it's like a political decision if you're going to combine yourself to open access literature, you may be missing some evidence or some research, but you're also saying you know this is this is accessible and it's replicable, and if you're if we're following principles of open science and you're doing systematic review of closed literature, that's not a replicable study or. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I think, you know, we all play the game, don't we? So when I wrote my learning design book for Springer, when I put the proposal in, I said, I'm going to live blog chapters as I go. And they accepted that. And actually, that made the book much, much better because people came back to the blog post and said, I really like this. I'm not sure what you mean by this. And have you seen these references? So the book was informed by the wider community. And at the end, I had a, a referable uh, product but I also had that history of open versions of the chapters. Hi. Um, you, you've limited yourself to open access uh, articles. Uh, what I see is that a lot of things are happening and interesting things are set on blog posts. Yeah. And, uh, and that's uh, often that that's more um, up to date than a lot of articles. So um, how do you look at that? Um, I started blogging back in 2007, and actually I emailed Martin, I don't know if you remember this, Martin, and said, I'm thinking of blogging, and he gave me some really good advice. And it's all my fault. <laughs> it's all my fault. <laughs> all my rubbish that's out there. And actually the blogging is invaluable, and I often use the blog as a place to work up half-baked ideas. So I developed a taxonomy for MOOCs, for example, and I put it in a blog post, and eventually I published it in a, a journal article. So I agree, I think the blogosphere is incredibly valuable, increasingly important. The other thing is, if I publish in a closed journal, I'll be lucky if five people read the abstract. If I publish a blog post and I tweet it, it goes to 10,000 people, and then invariably two or three people will tweet it. So it's getting to a far greater audience. I think for most of us, people know our work through our blog posts rather than our closed journals. Great initiative, I think, Gronia, um, and I completely agree with you. The more reading we do, the better. I, I wondered about your reflections on what's happened in the UK. Um, this is a UK-centric question, I know, but uh, for people who are not aware, in uh, the UK, the research excellence um, framework exercise, that, that's what we are doing, lots of reading to judge our own publications. But they made a, a decision that to be eligible, uh, to be reported on for and judged therefore in the research excellence exercise, that uh, journal articles had to be open access. And I th personally, I think that's a really significant shift into considering the quality of publications on their own merit rather than, you know, um, I mean, I do have colleagues who still want to do ICI ranked journals and think that that's the gold standard. But I think the combination of that push from the general ref panel and the statement by the education panel that they don't look at outputs, this, the location of the outputs, they read all the articles that they get to judge. I think, I think both of those things are moving us in the right direction. But interested to know what your thoughts I, are. I totally agree. I think it, that's a really significant shift. And in parallel, a lot of funding bodies are requiring the outputs from projects to be publicly available. And that's got to be a good thing. It has to be. I mean, as researchers, 
Um, we want to get our work out there and we want to get feedback on it. So the more open it is, the better, the more likely we'll get a reaction to it. So, um, Yeah, uh, just I, I mentioned the POR at Al study there recently. They're kind of my, one of my current ed tech, fem ed tech heroes, I guess. Uh, but they've got a cool service called Unpaywall that they've developed, which is which is brilliant. But they have another thing which is called Impact Story. And you could do this, if you like, as a reflective exercise. You can go into Impact Story and put in your, your name or your, possibly your ORCID ID, and it will tell you where you are in the percentile for open access publishing in the world. So it will say you're in the top 3% of your, X percent of your publications are open access, which is really nice, and possibly something you can do to evidence to your institution if you, if you ever need to about your publishing. Um, okay, thank you very much. We're